let's start with some basic facts about subplot space. So, space. Uh, so, uh, the fact that we are first going to consider is the following thing. So, the theorem. That dhj of f of x be defined to be this difference quotient, to be f of x plus h ej minus f of x. Okay? So this is without yet dividing by h. Um, this is uh, probably more standard this way. So if, so this way, so. U belongs to W one P omega. If and only if this difference quotient uh, divided by H itself is uniformly bounded or forms a uniformly bounded sequence. Lock of omega means in every compact subset of omega, this thing forms a uniformly bounded sequence. All right, second fact. All right, so suppose we have a sequence uh, WK belonging to, say, LP omega, and we're doing scalar valued functions. No, no, we're not. We're doing vector valued functions. like this uh, and UK tends weakly uh, in LP to U which we call means whenever we test with something in the hold the conjugate space then the integral of this thing tends to the integral of this thing if F from Rn into R is convex then the limit as k goes to infinity of the integral of omega f of uk is bigger than or equal to the integral of omega f of u dx, like this. So it's lower semi-continuous. So um, this is of particular use in calculus of variations because often you're minimizing some kind of an energy. If your energy is convex, then you can simply take a, a subsequence that, that minimizes the energy, and that subsequence will be bounded in LP normally for some easy reason because of growth of this function. So they have a subsequence that will converge weakly, and the weak limit will be the minimizer or a minimizer because it will be less than this sequence that is going down towards the lowest possible energy of this thing. Yeah. So this is one of the basic useful terms in calculus of variations. And um, let's prove it in one dimension. It's not much hard, much harder when uh, we are doing this in high dimensions. So omega could be in anything, Rm. So we're going to do this when m and n equals 1. So we have a sequence uk, lp, some interval ap like this. Scalar valued now, and the point of this is that that weak convergence commutes with with affine mapping. So if L is affine, i.e., L of x equals a x plus b, then the integral of L of u k dx is the integral of a of 
your k of x plus b dx, and then you can see what's going to happen. This is uh, that's, that's any subset s s, which is equal to a the integral of s u k of x dx plus b the measure of s. Right, and then weak convergence is convergence on averages, so this thing will converge to the integral of s of u of x like this, a plus b the measure of s, and that thing is exactly s l of u dx. Right, so if we have an affine mapping, then weak convergence is totally good. Right. So this compare this with what we've seen a few times that when we act on the weakly converging sequence of gradients with with the determinant, then we actually have the same holding true, but the determinant is wildly nonlinear, which is one of the things that makes it so surprising. This is just for arbitrary functions. We're not using any determinant, any gradient structure, but uh, but we see that that affineness. Is 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 the, is is the right thing? Like this can easily get messed up if you don't have affine. It's not hard to come up with examples. Okay, so if we have a convex function, note that that f itself is the supremum of a bunch of affine functions being convex. So I'm going to express it like this, is equal to the supremum, L is affine, and then L is less than or equal to F, like this, right? So if we have an affine function, sorry, if we have a convex function, then for every affine function underneath it, if we take the supremum of all those affine functions, then we are actually going to get back the actual function itself. Yeah. So then we could make this a little bit more, um, we could break this into stages. So, so you can take uh, n belong to natural numbers and then pick family of affine functions. of affine functions, let's say L N one all the way up to L N N such that F is equal to the limit as N goes to infinity of the supremum of this affine family. Let's call them F n. L belongs to F n. Uh, and all of these functions underneath are function F, uh, function capital F, L of x, like this. Let's write that F and k of x is less than or equal to f itself, right? So you can see that we can do this with, you know, if we did this with whatever, with five, then we'd do pretty well. So this is the function from a to b. So we could pick five affine functions that is underneath it that, are, that approximate it fairly well. If we let the number go up to infinity, then we're actually gonna recover the entire function, the entire convex function, yeah? Cool. So. This is how we're going to do this for the general F. So we are going to have that, that what, that the integral of F of the limiting function U from A to B, this thing is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of uh, 
the integral uh, let's do this one step at a time so this thing is the integral from a to b of this limit as n goes to infinity of the supremum n l of u of x x like this since we're doing this over this bounded region and all of these affine guys uh, will be bounded guys this will be a bounded this will be a bounded uh, this will be a bounded set in this will be a bounded sequence in L2 as n goes to infinity um, because we can we can insist that these affine guys have a finite gradient and they are and they are and this constant defining them is also going to be bounded because we're dealing with a complex function on a bounded interval so all of this stuff will be bounded uh, by the L2 norm of u, and so we'll have a bounded sequence in L2 as n goes to infinity. So then we can pass this limit outside, dominated convergence theorem, like this. F n of L of U of X, the X like this. And then we can find some N which is sufficiently large so that this thing is, is um, gonna be bounded by the, the supremum over that particular N plus epsilon. Let's call that M actually. Like this. Right. And then for this M, um, each one of these guys in the finite family is going to be the supremum on some particular subset. Yeah. So we have a bunch of affine functions like this, right? And each guy is the maximum on some particular part. So this guy is the maximum on this interval, this guy is the maximum on this interval, and so on. Yeah? So let A M K be the set of X belonging to A B such that uh, L, uh, so we ordered them L N uh, K is bigger than or equal to L N Q. Uh, 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 oh, let's put the X inside. Let's write it like this for any Q belonging to one up to n like this. Okay. That will form a nice interval. And therefore, this integral here star is going to be the same as the sum over all of these sub pieces. So k equals one up to n of the integral of a n k of uh, so I can put the I mean this is a de disjoint decomposition into our interval but on each one of these a n k by definition we have that this guy here is the guy that's actually achieving this maximum so we can write it like this dx yeah cool now uh, we have fixed n. 
oh, M. We have fixed M like this, right? So for fixed M, these are just pre-chosen affine functions. These are pre-chosen sets, right? So then this thing, uh, the epsilon is here, thank you. Plus epsilon should have been here. Yeah. So um, when I say star, I mean the thing without the epsilon. So let's call this thing star. So we can let our sequence, uh, we called it K, K is bad shoes, let's call it Q. We can let our sequence UQ tend towards U, right? And then this thing will tend, will be the limit of L, M, K, U, Q, right? Because again, this is just an affine function and this is just a set, yeah? And there are finitely many of these, so this is actually gonna be the same as the limit as Q tends to infinity of the sum from K equals one up to M of the integral of A M K of L M K U Q of X dx like this. Yeah. Yeah. And this thing here, let's erase some space. Well, maybe, we, yeah, okay, we need a bit more space. This thing here is, um, this is independent of uh, U, uh, UQ, right? This, is, this set is just defined to be the set of points on the interval AB such that this thing is, is the maximum affine guy in this finite collection we've chosen, right? Yeah. So this is, let's call this star star, this whole thing is actually bounded by the integral from A to B of F of UQ, right? Yeah. Or I could just do it in two stages. I could say that this thing is bigger and equal to the supremum of L belong to FM of all of these guys acting on UQ, but that would be exactly the same thing as this thing. You see what I mean? Yeah. And by construction, this supremum is less than the actual function F itself. Yeah. Cool. So we have that this guy, which is the, which is the weak limit, uh, which is the weak F acting on the weak limit is less than this guy, which is less than this guy plus epsilon. Then epsilon goes down to zero and we have that this is actually true. Yeah, so we um, apply it at this step right here that, that these guys are all affine functions integrated on some finite set. So we're just passing through the limit like this. Yeah, cool. All right, so um, this proves this result, yeah? And um, what did we use? We used that if we have a convex function uh, from Rn to R, well, we did this in R1, but it's also true if we have a convex function from Rn to R, then, then it is the supremum of these affine functions that live underneath it. You know, just think about a two-dimensional bowl and you can just approximate it underneath by a bunch of affine functions. And that's the only property we did. So it's easier to draw pictures and to visualize this um, in one dimension, but all of this thing works perfectly well in, in, in when, we take, um, when we take functions from whatever space into our n, where n is bigger than one, right? Um, but what this doesn't work so well for is when we have, uh, when we have, when we have energies that, that, uh, that are not, uh, when we have, when we have things, when we have F that are acting on matrices, um, yeah, uh, 
for reasons I'll get into later. So, uh, so this, this is very convenient for, for this situation, but it's not conv so convenient in more general situations. Um, and this, by the way, is an if and only if. So, so we've shown that if f is convex, then this is true, and the converse is also the case, that, that if we have some f in the situation that is low is semi-continuous, then it has to be convex. And, and that too is not too hard to show, because if it's, uh, if you have this non-convexity part, then you can create a sequence that, that, that is going to, going to exploit that. Um, you're going to be, so if you had a part which was non-convex, you can create a sequence that has lots of points here and here, but the weak limit is here, which will have energy which is higher with this kind of alpha, this kind of laminate type construction we've done. So. This is an if and only if. All right. These are the background facts. So you remember when I talked about Soblo space, one of the main purposes of this was to obtain a, a, a space of functions for which there is a notion of derivative, but, but, but nevertheless, the space of functions is, is complete. It forms a Banach space. The sequences that are Cauchy with respect to the norm we create are going to be, have limits that are actually inside the space. And that's not true for C1 functions or CK functions. So um, to do something like calculus of variations, you want to minimize something. You want the minimizing object to be still inside the space. And uh, that's what Sobolov functions allow you to do. Um, but you sacrifice the notion of pointwise derivative. So I, I said it's like a chess sacrifice. You sacrifice a piece in order to gain strategic advantage. So by sacrificing the concept of, a, of an actual derivative, you have the space that is complete. You no longer have a derivative, but, uh, but you can obtain the derivative back by, by first obtaining a solution and then using the solution itself. And that is essentially the main idea of elliptic regularity. The simplest manifestation of this is to do this for this minimization problem. So if we let or one of the simplest u of at i of u be the integral around omega of the gradient of u squared dx, where u um, is some function from w1, that's 2, omega into r. And this is a part I have to be sketchy about, that we can actually define u to have boundary values using something called a, th a trace theorem for subplot functions, which is highly non-trivial because, as Hyogo was just talking about, these things only defined almost everywhere, so to actually make them be defined on a set of lower dimension is definitely a non-trivial thing, but it can be done, and it can be done in a rigorous way using the fact we have one weak derivative, basically, that we can integrate up to the boundary. Um, so this part you'll have to just believe me on, but, but once we are in this position, then we can minimize over Sobolov space and extract some subsequent. So let UK belonging to W, let's call it, let's call this FG. So FG equals set of U such that U belongs to W12 omega and U satisfies star, where well, this is star, okay? So let's, this thing belong to FG, such that limit as K goes to infinity of I of UK is equal to I of u. For sure we can do this because we're minimizing and we just take the sequence which this is true. Everybody happy with that? Yeah? Cool. So then what we notice, so gradient of uk is a mapping from r or from omega into rn, right? Because we have scalar valued functions, you yeah? know, and f of uh, dot, which is equal to just 
the norm squared is a nice convex function. Yeah. And this thing ensures that our sequence is uniformly bounded in the sublog norm because this thing is controlling the, the norm of the gradient in the L2 sense, right? So UK is bounded in W1, 2. So a subsequence We have that UKN is going to converge weakly in W12 to U, which this particular means the gradients UKN converge weakly in L2, the gradient now. And right. now, um, so. Uh, this guy right here, uh, assuming we have a G for which we have finite energy, and if we don't have finite energy, then lower semi-continuity is trivial because everything is infinite. Uh, but if this thing is finite, then this sequence right here is tending towards a finite quantity. Uh, so in particular, this thing is finite for all large enough K. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, yeah, that can be derived from Poincaré inequality, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. You need some Poincaré inequality to, to conclude that we have a bounded sequence in W12, yes. Yeah, good point. Okay, so these guys converge weakly in L2, and therefore by lower, sem lower semi-continuity, we have that this is indeed the minimizer, so the infimum of all functions, let's call them V, yeah. Belong to f of g of i of this thing is given by this guy, right? So if we let g of t, and we've done this before, be i of this t times some test function where phi is a compactly supported test function entire region, yeah, then g of t has a minimum when t equals zero, yeah, and therefore it's a critical point, so g prime at zero is what happens when we differentiate this thing, so it's the limit as t goes to zero of i of, uh, let's, let's write it out, So the limit as t goes to zero of the integral of omega of u plus t gradient of phi squared minus gradient of u squared over t dt. Expand out this thing, limit as t goes to zero omega of du dot product d phi times t squared phi like this. Uh, one of the t's cancels, I mean we're dividing by t, so it's like this. And um, this guy is compactly supported, It's this thing is uniformly bounded, so we can pass to the limit, this thing will just vanish, and this thing is just the integral like this. Okay. And that's just the Laplacian in weak form, right? So we have this thing is equal to zero, i.e. u satisfies Laplacian in weak form. So we write it like this in distributional form like this. Damn it, I'm overrunning. I'm gonna keep going. Leave whenever you have to leave. Um, so we have this thing is, is true, and we have that the limiting function is in Sobolov space, right? And u belongs to w12 of omega. 
But that's all we know. But I claim that this thing, this elliptic regularity, uh, this weak solution of this elliptic PDE, allows us to actually recover the pointwise derivative relatively easily. And it follows by doing something which is called the Cacipoli inequality. So take, go ahead. Uh, no, no, we take a, we take a, yeah, we take a sequence. Yeah, converges the infimum. Yes, keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. That's it exactly. Yeah. Um, but the IU is is just is just a uh, is just a Sobolev function. Uh, and now our goal is to actually show it's actually a smooth function. Um, and we did this already. I mean, I gave you a little sketch of Wales lemma how uh, how how this weakly solving Laplace's equation actually gives us pointwise uh, a smooth solution. Um, but now I'm going to show a kind of more general method um, uh, using this difference quotient stuff and something called the Cacipoli inequality to, to show how we could do this for a much wider class of PDs because we haven't used much about, uh, about the Laplacian right now, right? It's just a, this is the simplest example to come up with. Um, uh, but I'll talk about what, what more general ones we can have later. But let's, let's see how we can use this weak, this weak solution of Laplacian. So if we take for some constant lambda, let's take, take a test function phi, which is compactly supported in omega. Take some lambda, we'll choose it later. And then let's take phi to be this thing, to be uh, phi of u minus lambda, like this. Okay, so since u is in Sobolev space, then I claim that we also have this identity for this particular phi, because we can take the gradient of u, and that gradient will be the limit of a sequence in L2 of smooth things, and for smooth things, we have that this is true. And this guy is also bounded in L2. So um, we can replace this identity with actually anything which is in, which any phi which is in Sobolev space. Okay. So we can plug this guy directly into our, into our weak equation. And we'll have that du. And we'll have firstly du of u minus lambda. And then we're going to have phi, uh, uh, oops, du, oops, everything is wrong here. That's du times phi. And then the phi of u minus lambda, like this, dx. And then what's that? That's the integral of du squared phi. And then this thing here, the integral of the u, uh, 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 sorry, I'm screwing this stuff up. So this is right, this is du like this, and that's du times d phi. phi u minus lambda like this, dx, okay? And then this thing is zero just by the fact we have a weak solution. But if we look closely at this thing, then what does that allow us to do? That allows us to put this thing on one side and it's less than the absolute value of the u by u minus lambda, like this, dx, okay? Now, let us assume that phi was actually itself a number which is a test function which is squared. So phi is equal to rho squared. And therefore, d phi is equal to two rho row, yeah, and 
Therefore, we're going to have rho squared here. And here we're going to have u rho, I mean, this is just making it a little bit nicer, rho v rho. And then this thing we can control by Holders or, or Cauchy Schwartz inequality, du squared rho squared 1 over 2, and then this thing here, um, d rho u minus lambda, everything squared 1 over 2. Yeah? Now, this thing is this thing squared, yeah? and this thing is just a bounded quantity. So lambda is arbitrary. We could take lambda to be whatever, the average of u on omega, if we wanted to. Uh, rho is just, is just phi squared. Phi is just some compactly supported test function that, for example, is equal to 1 on a subregion, and it's 0 elsewhere. And what that allows us to do is to control this, this, this higher gradient by this lower gradient. So let me put the conclusion somewhere here. So we have that. Rho squared dx is controlled by like this, okay? And you might think, okay, so, so what? Uh, why, is this, why is this good? Um, well, this is good. So I'm aware I'm running over. I'm gonna try and wrap it up, but leave whenever you need to. So this is good because we can also apply this to the difference quotient of u because the difference quotient will also satisfy this weak, this weak Laplacian, right? So if we have this, yeah. then we can do the following. So we have that the u of x dot the phi of x dx equals zero. We could choose a test function, which is just shifting forward a little bit u of x dot d phi of x plus h times some direction ej like this is equal to zero as well because that's also a perfectly nice compactly supported function right so we take the difference of the two and we do this change of variables that i did before so we'll have that d of du of x plus or in this case, it'll be minus, makes no difference, minus h e j minus x like this, uh, dot product this thing is equal to zero. In other words, this difference quotient, the h j u, is weakly harmonic. Right? Thumbs up if you agree. Yeah. So every step we did here, we can replace it with this partial difference right here. Yeah. So that means that this identity means that the gradient of the partial difference squared is controlled by the part by something which is bounded. The test function has bounded gradient times the partial difference itself. Yeah. And in this case, we can just take lambda to be equal to zero if we wanted to. Yeah, so I'll write this down and then I'll wrap up. You can't imagine what's going on. Is that what you say? Okay. And, uh, okay, I'll answer that. So put, dhj of u into star star 
and then we're going to have that the integral of d of dhj of u squared times rho dx is bounded by omega of d rho of dhj of u squared dx. And by the thing that I started off with, the thing I'm trying to prove that this thing is a uniformly bounded sequence in L2 because u is in Sobolev space, that means that this thing is a uniformly bounded sequence in L2, yeah? which means that the derivative of u will have its jth partial derivative um, uniformly bounded, yeah? which means that the jth partial derivative of the derivative of u will itself be a Sobolev function. Right, which implies that that uh, the jth partial derivative of u actually belongs to w one two. So we've gained uh, we've gained the whole derivative, yeah. And this is for whatever j for j equals one two up to n, i.e. that the u actually belongs to w one two i.e. that the u squared belongs to L2, we've gained another derivative. Yeah? And once we gain one derivative this way, we can do this partial difference again, right? Uh, so we can, we can, once we conclude this, then the fact that we have that u weakly solves the Laplacian, then passing to the limit, we have that the partial derivative, any partial derivative of u also weakly solves the Laplacian, and then we can do this whole argument again. And we can gain all the weak derivatives that we want. Yeah. So repeat. And we have all derivatives, weak derivatives we want. And so I'll just repeat. Uh, and once we have all these weak derivatives, then some of the stuff I was telling you about briefly kicks in, that once we have weak derivatives in LP, then the function itself is more integrable than it, than it than previously was. So once we have in the space, when we're doing this in L2, for example, if the gradient is in L2, then the function is in LP for any P, which is less than infinity. So if we do this in L2 and we have that uh, the second gradient in L2, then the gradient itself is in, well, let's do this, keep, let's do this until we have a third gradient in L2. If the third gradient's in L2, then the second gradient's in LP for any P, and therefore the other part of Sobolev embedding is that if we have enough integrability of the gradient, then the actual function is holder. So therefore the gradient itself will be holder, right? Uh, and then, as you can see, if we have this for any order of derivative, then we, then we have that any order of derivative is holder, right? So we have pointwise smooth derivatives to any order by, by just doing this trick, yeah? yeah. So this is an example of, of, of the chess sacrifice. You sacrifice pointwise derivatives to be able to obtain an equation, an actual weakly form, a, a weak equation of some kind. But the fact you have a weak equation is sufficiently strong that it allows you to win back the derivatives that you lost. Yeah. And uh, it, it happened, it works very neatly for, 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 for the Laplacian, but, um, but it also works for, for a, whole, a, whole, a, whole, a whole family of other PDEs you might want to obtain. Uh, so this, this machinery, this, this thing of, being in la of having the possibility of, of passing to the limit in the Sobolev space, considering weak derivatives, is extremely powerful. It gives us it gives us a way to obtain solutions to minimization problems to PDE uh, classical solutions with pointwise derivatives that that previously had to be handled in each case by ad hoc methods. Now this is like this like steamroll over a machine to do all of these things with um, relatively little technical difficulty. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's relatively smooth. Okay, so Yoga, your question. Um, yeah, this is a reverse Poincare inequality. We're controlling the function. We're controlling the derivative in terms of the function. And um, yeah, it is, it is, it is surprising in a sense. It, 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 
But if we think about where this gradient came from, this gradient came from minimizing this energy u, which was the integral of the gradient squared. So the gradient is trying to, to be as flat as possible, as quickly as possible. We have some non-zero boundary condition, and this thing is kind of flattening out, right? Trying to, trying to agree with the, non, the, the boundary condition and get as flat as quickly as possible. So um, the fact that, uh, that, that the gradients are am amenable to be controlled by the function is kind of, is kind of, is kind of what you'd expect because, because yeah, the gradient is, you know, the, the gradient is trying to, is trying to flatten out. So in the program inequality, we take this lambda to be the average of the function on a ball. Yeah. And um, this, this thing, so I should just write this down, so. This gradient of rho would contribute a one over r if r is equal to the ball. If we did this on a ball like this, so we'd have, this is a ball, let's say, of radius two r, and this is a ball of radius r. We'll have the test function be one on this ball of radius r, right? So then gradient of rho would be less than one over r, yeah? So then if we take lambda to be the average of the ball the, of u on a ball of radius 2r, then what would this give us? It gives us that on a ball of radius r around x, u squared dx is less than r to the minus 2, this thing like this. This time, ball of radius 2r of u minus its average, so it's right u hat like this for its average squared like this, yeah? So if we take L2 norms, then this becomes like this, r to the minus one, like this, yeah? And then if we put the r on the other side, we have it like this. But let's not do it, let's leave it like this, yeah? And this is this is yeah, this is kind of this is kind of natural. Um, let me think how I say it. so. So the standard Poincaré inequality would be exactly the reverse, that we have the integral of the ball of 2r of u minus its average squared 1 over 2 would be less than r, the integral of the ball of radius 2r, except we have a smaller sub-ball like this, 1 over 2, yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't have better words than 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 what I said. Uh, uh, yeah, so this I mean it just looks like a formal trick, just this, just using the product rule and then breaking this thing up and putting the gradient on the other side. But um, but implicit in that is that we do have a harmonic equation, a weakly harmonic equation, which comes from something we're trying to minimize the gradient. So so yeah. I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't have any particularly good words. But if you play with this, if you play with this, with this trick, then it'll start to seem natural to you. Uh, when I, when I first started doing elliptic PDE or studying elliptic PDE, I, 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 I felt a bit the same. That it's these things are following from these formal, formal algebraic almost reasons. Uh, but, but I guess if you do an algebraic reason often enough, then it starts to feel like it's uh, a, a natural thing. Um, yeah. All right, everybody happy. Monday, I will see you all on Wednesday.